Discover the power of one. Well, I am thrilled and honored to be here. Thank you, Pastor Mark and Linda, and uh, thank you. This is amazing that this many people come out on a Tuesday morning. Uh, God is doing something extra special right here, and you are extra special. Now, I have a long presentation. I'm going to give you a, a condensed, just a portion of it. But in the first part, I go through all the miracles that happened when America broke away from the King of England. I mentioned yesterday how the most common form of government is a king. And as these centuries go on, these kingdoms go bigger and bigger and bigger. From Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, it's like every generation wants to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And so you have uh, Sargon of Acadia conquers from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, 2250 BC. And then you have uh, Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan and uh, kills 30 million people from Korea to Hungary. But finally, the King of England was the most powerful king that planet Earth had ever seen. He controlled 13 million square miles, a half a billion people. All of India, a quarter of the world's population right there. Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, and America. And America's founders decide we're going to break away from this most powerful king, and we have no army and no navy, just a bunch of courageous people with faith. And so America is a miracle in world history. And when we get a chance to set up a government, we want to run as far away from a king as possible. And we split it, and we put the power in the hands of the people. Well, I'm going to pick up from the end of our revolution and tell you what happened afterwards. And all this is in the books and DVDs I have. Ronald Reagan gave a great quote. He said, uh, in 1775, the Continental Congress proclaimed the first national day of prayer. And um, there we go. And uh, in 1783, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the long, weary Revolutionary War, during which a national day of prayer had been proclaimed every spring for eight years. And uh, it looks like, for some reason, the uh, screen is um, not... Uh, yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll figure this out. So while they're going through that, we had a revolution. France had a revolution. We had a Great Awakening revival before our revolution. France, you know what they had before their revolution? Voltaire. And Voltaire was mocking Christianity. He had this brilliant wit, and he would poke fun at it and make And all of a sudden, he became in charge of the tone on academia. And so on the college campuses, it became the in vogue thing to mock Christianity. And he began to spread this around France. And so they had a generation of pulling the rug out. Now in America, it had a Protestant foundation. Uh, you had 98% of the country was Protestant. Catholics were only allowed in three colonies, and then about a tenth of a percent were Jewish. France had been a Catholic country, and it had a king. And so there wasn't the striving to uh, impart the Bible knowledge on a level uh, that was the same as in America. And so what happened was when France had its revolution, the bottom fell out. And they ended up bringing people into the streets of Paris and chopping off heads. And so 40,000 people had their heads chopped off in Paris, France. Uh, they would take whole convents of nuns and bring them in and just chop off their heads. And so it was this bloody revolution that we didn't experience in America. We got rid of our king and we had a moral populace. They got rid of their king and the bottom fell out. And so picking up with that, we see that uh, we ended up getting into a war with France. And uh, it was called a pseudo-war, but they broke all their treaties with America. And they began to capture our American ships and stick our crews in the dungeons. And um, we uh, decided to send over ambassadors to France and try to patch it up. And that's when they uh, said, if you bribe us under the table, we'll uh, have, uh, we'll end the piracy of your ships. And so they bribed under the table. Um, it was the cry went out across America, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And so they ended up, uh, we had Thomas Jefferson, uh, as, uh, or John Adams as the president. John Adams had a day of fasting and prayer. And uh, America, again, we had a second Great Awakening revival. I'm not sure if the PowerPoint is, is up and running yet, so I'm going to fast forward through the, the miracles of the uh, Revolutionary War uh, for the sake of time and uh, get to the ones with the French Revolution. So all this is in my DVDs and books on the table, uh, fascinating stories. 
but for the sake of time, I'm going to pick up with after our revolution. So this is all going into your subconscious. You'll have dreams about this tonight. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what Bill talked about. Anyway, here's a great quote from uh, a James Meacham, congressman, 1854. He says, down to the revolution, every colony did sustain religion in some form. It was deemed peculiarly proper that the religion of liberty should be upheld by a free people. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. They were Christians that fought. Great quote from Chief Justice John Jay, Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. All other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. John Jay goes on, your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. If I were to sum up why America is great, it would be that line right there. Your lives, your liberty, your property are at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. There's no king, there's no dictator, there's no pharaoh that's determining that you're in a lower class or you're in a uh, low, an untouchable or you're um, having to be relegated to taking the care of the garbage the rest of your life. It's just you and your creator. And you're only limited by your hard work and your creativity. And so Ronald Reagan said, in this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. You get rid of one king, you get another. Communism is nothing more than monarchy. Right? Every communist country has a dictator. Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Castro, Mao Zedong. Communist party members are the new royalty. They get to live in the nice houses. And then the people are the peasants. The college students say, well, uh, I, th I thought communism and socialism was everybody owned everything equally. It's like, let's think a little deeper. Who decides who lives in the nice house and who lives in the dumpy house? Uh, somebody in the government dictates those things. Well, whoever ultimately dictates those things is the dictator. <laughs> and so, and you know, oh, well, socialism, isn't that great? Well, yeah, uh, National Socialist Workers' Party, right? And that was called Nazi and Hitler was the head of it, and the USSR is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It was ruled by Stalin, and so socialism and communism is just a monarchy remake. It's just changing up the names, and so anyway, Reagan goes on to say, in this country of ours took place the greatest revolution. He says, here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, the founding fathers established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. You get to decide what gifts God has put inside of you and how you can develop them and be all that God created you to be. In America, and uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a poet, said, America appears like a last effort in, of divine providence in behalf of the human race. These people understood how unique our country is. So our founders took the power of a king and they separated it into three branches, separated it at federal estate level, and then tied up this federal Frankenstein with 10 handcuffs we call the first 10 amendments. All our constitution is is a bunch of hurdles to prevent the rubber band from snapping back into the hands of a king. And um, so France has its revolution. Louis the 16th, the nice guy, he sent his navy over to help us get free from Britain. Well, he got in debt, right? When you win a war, you, you're supposed to get something in return. They got zero except debt. And then France had a couple years where the crops failed and they didn't have bread. Remember, they went to Queen Marie Antoinette and says, the people don't have bread. And she said, let them eat cake. It wasn't her fault. She just grew up in court. And so the people in France said, if we can just chop off the king and queen's heads, all of our problems will be solved. They chop them off. It didn't turn things around. And then they decided to chop off the heads of all the royalty. And uh, it still didn't turn around. Then they chop off the heads of all the wealthy. They have money. We don't have money. They must be selfish. It still didn't turn around. Then they chopped off the heads of the businessmen and farmers. And uh, they have stuff. We don't have stuff. They're selfish. It still didn't turn around. Then they chopped off the heads of the hoarders, the people that have extra food in their closets right? We don't have enough. They have too much. They're selfish. And then they chop off the heads of all the clergy because uh, they're speaking out against the head chopping off stuff. Somehow they're to blame. And then they chop off the heads of the former revolutionaries, the ones that used to chop off heads but got tired of it. Again, 40,000 people. You contrast that with America? It was a bloodbath. And so Yale President Ezra St um, um, Timothy Dwight gives an address, but he says about the year 1728, Voltaire, so celebrated for his wit and not less distinguished for his hatred of Christianity and his abandonment of principle, formed a systematical design to destroy Christianity. 
and introduce in its stead a general diffusion of irreligion and atheism. Sort of like the ACLU on steroids. And the principal part of this system were the compilation of an encyclopedia in which with great art and insidiousness the doctrines of Christian theology were rendered absurd and ridiculous. The being of God was ridiculed. Possession of property was pronounced robbery, right? You have stuff, you're evil. Chastity and natural affection were declared to be nothing more than groundless prejudices. What's uh, chastity? Natural. That would sort of be like um, uh, sexual uh, morality, right? So they want to throw off, they want to have their, their bathrooms and their gay marriage and um, adultery, assassination, poisonings, and other crimes of like infernal nature were taught lawful, provided the end was good. The education of youth, books replete with infidelity, irreligion, immorality, and obscenity, sort of a common core type thing. To destroy us, therefore, our enemies must first destroy our Sabbath and seduce us from the house of God. This was going on in France prior to their bloody French Revolution. And they Closed down the churches. Uh, they turned churches into temples of reason. Religious monuments were destroyed. Robespierre was the head of their homeland security, their committee on public safety. He gave an address on using terror to force this religious, largely Catholic country to embrace secularism, right? Forcing their conscience. And, um, Graves were desecrated, crosses were uh, forbidden, no private and public worship was allowed, church education was outlawed, priests and ministers and those who harbored them were executed on sight. Very similar to what happened in Mexico in 1917. They, then there was a rural area called the Vendee. And they thought, well, we're out of the, the, we're hundreds of miles from Paris. We're fine. Well, no, they send their secular army and they kill 300,000 men, women, and children. And so Robespierre was the head of their country. He was the uh, head of their homeland security, their committee on public safety. He puts a prostitute in Notre Dame Cathedral, covers her with a sheet and said, this is the goddess of reason. Let's worship her. And um, they decide they don't like done in the year of the Lord, like our constitution. So they make 1792 the new year one. They don't want a seven-day week with a Sabbath rest, so they come up with a 10-day week. They had uh, 12 months with three decade weeks in a month with 10 days each. And each day had 10 decimal hours. There was a French Revolution clock, right? 10 hours in the day. And each hour is divided into 100 decimal minutes and each minute into 100 decimal seconds. They decide that 10 was the number of man, 10 fingers and 10 toes. So they made every measurement in France divisible by 10. They called it the metric system. Maybe that's why I never really liked the metric system. And so during this time, they break the treaties with America, and uh, we send over ambassadors, and their French foreign minister, Talleyrand, says, uh, you know, we'll, if we bribe him, he'll stop the attacks, and cry goes across America, millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. Talleyrand was such a liar, he says, we were given speech to hide our thoughts, right? Maybe like some politicians today. So in America, we have a President John Adams, and he declares a day of fasting and prayer. Listen to this, 1798-99. As the people of the United States are still held in jeopardy by insidious acts of a foreign nation, as well as by dissemination among them of those principles subversive to all the foundations of religious, moral, and social obligations. What's that second thing he's talking about? That's that French infidelity came across into the campuses, right? And so these, it became the in vogue thing. So he called it subversive to all the foundations of religious moral. He says, I hereby recommend a day of solemn humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that the citizens call to mind their numerous offenses against the Most High God, confess them before him with sincerest penitence, implore his pardoning mercy through the great mediator and redeemer for our past transgressions, and through the grace of his Holy Spirit, we may yield a suitable obedience to his righteous requisition. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So what happened next is we had a great awakening revival, a second great awakening. And so we had a first great awakening in our revolution. France had this bloodbath and Voltaire and Robespierre and their revolution. Well, we have a second great awakening. And so there's a pastor in Kentucky who gets his church to fast and pray one Saturday a month, and they have a meeting. 500 people show up. The next year, 1,500. The next year, 8,000. 15,000 thousand the next year. 25,000 people show up in the Kentucky woods. And they don't have microphones back then. And so they build these platforms and every hundred yards, another platform and every hundred yards, another platform. They're all preaching at the same time. So you go out of the earshot of one preacher and you hear another. Some are fasting and some are on their knees. Some are crying. Some are praising the Lord. It's all happening. This is amazing. And it crosses racial lines. And uh, there's black Harry Hoosier was a Methodist preacher. He was illiterate, but he rode around with Francis Asbury, the circuit riding preacher, listened to his sermons and memorized whole passages of scripture. And he was this great preacher. And then Richard Allen was ordained by Francis Asbury. And he started the African Methodist Episcopal Church. During this time, missionaries are sent out to the Caribbean, to Hawaii, to Burma. We're impacting the nation. I mean, the world. American Bible Society started, American Tract Society, and then we have prison reform, hospital reform, and the abolitionist movement starts during this time. 
And we have a preacher who used to be an attorney. Uh, his name was Charles Finney. And he uh, invented altar calls. He says, you serve the devil openly. I'm calling you to stand up and make a declaration for Christ openly. And his preaching of you can't just sit there and be a, a Christian. You got to show your faith by doing something. That inspired William Booth to start the Salvation Army and George Williams to start the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. Here, America is impacting the world by the Second Great Awakening Revival. Well, what happened next? Well, in times of crises, people turn to Christ. And so we have another crisis and our country again turns to Christ, but it's the Muslim Barbary Pirate war. I shared a little bit about this, but um, Muhammad transitions from being a religious leader to a political leader to a military leader, and the Muslims quickly conquer all these Christian areas of the world. Yemen, which used to be a Jewish area, Jerusalem had been Christian, Syria used to be Christian, Turkey used to be Christian, North Africa used to be Christian. Do you know that they invaded Rome, Italy in 846 AD? And they trashed the Basilica of St. Peter's. 11,000 Muslims go around Rome, and they trashed the bones of St. Peter and St. Paul. It was after that that Pope Leo decided to build the wall around the Vatican, right? So we have the Pope building a wall to keep the Muslims out. Some of you will catch that. All right. And so there were whole coasts of Italy that had no women of childbearing age for generations because the Muslims would come up and capture these women, take them to their harems. There were whole Catholic orders in Europe through the Middle Ages called the Trinitarians. The head of the order was called the Ransomer. And they would collect alms and donations, go under a white flag to try to ransom back your friend that was captured by the Muslim pirates. They enslaved 180 million Africans. They would castrate the men, make them eunuchs. They'd sell them throughout the, the, the Timbuktu in North Africa. And um, anyway, uh, and so then they began to raid ships. And so the European countries would pay annual tributes. Spain, Sweden, England, France would pay millions of dollars to these Muslim pirates to get them to stop attacking. And so uh, I'm going to skip past some battles. And so finally, they were attacking American ships. We broke from Britain. And they say, hey, you're not covered by the British extortion tribute payments. No, no, we're independent of Britain. Huh, that means you need to pay up. And they began to capture our American ships. We were paying 20% of our U.S. federal budget to these Muslim pirates. Finally, Thomas Jefferson gets fed up, sends in our Navy and our Marines. Stephen Decatur goes in and burns the captured ship to Philadelphia. The oldest military monument in the U.S. is to honor the heroes of the Muslim Barbary Pirate War. Well, Francis Scott Key writes a song nine years before he writes the Star Spangled Banner to the same tune that he writes the Star Spangled Banner. It's when the warrior returns from battle afar. Listen to some of these lines. See if you can see some phrases he uses later when he writes the Star Spangled Banner. In conflict resistless, each toil they endured till their foes shrunk dismayed from the war's desolation and pale beamed the crescent, its splendor obscured by the light of the star spangled flag of our nation, where each flaming star gleamed a meteor of war and the turbaned head bowed to the terrible glare then mixed with the olive the laurel shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brow of the brave. Nine years before he writes the Star Spangled Banner. Well, again, we have this crisis. Our country's turning to Christ during the Second Great Awakening period. Well, France, remember all the head chopping off stuff? They end up getting a dictator named Napoleon. Napoleon conquers all of Europe. Six million people die in the Napoleonic Wars, and he invades Spain, and he puts his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. This is when Mexico breaks away. They're like, why should we be loyal to a Spanish throne with a French guy on top? Besides, Napoleon had been excommunicated by the Pope, and Mexico is largely Catholic, right? And so this is when New Spain and Guatemala and Brazil and everybody's breaking away because we don't want to be loyal to this Spanish throne with a French guy on top. Well, Napoleon takes the combined Spanish and French Navy, and he's going to invade England, and his Navy's defeated at the Battle of Trafalgar by Horatio Nelson. And this leaves Britain afterwards with the undisputed most powerful navy on the planet. And so uh, this was the French Empire at its greatest extent, and this is the British Empire. So the British Empire is officially the most powerful empire on planet Earth. And uh, now what happens next? Well, now that Napoleon's landlocked, he decides he's going to invade Russia with a half a million men. He comes out six months later with 50,000. Whoa, how do you lose 450,000 men in six months? Well, he did it. The, French, the, the Russians burnt all the fields in front of their troops, and Napoleon gets to Moscow. They tra emptied and trashed the city. Nobody surrenders to him, and after a while, winter starts setting in. His generals say, well, we need to get back to France. If he would have taken another route, he would have found food. He retraces his steps. The blizzards hit. The Russians attack. Napoleon crosses the Berezina River, and before his men can cross, the Russians attack. And here is Napoleon on the other side of the river watching his men getting slaughtered. He can't give him any orders. 
He goes back to Europe with, with 50,000, and he's banished to the island of Elba. At this time, the British have an army and a navy that defeated Napoleon, and what do they want to do with it? Uh, maybe send it to America? <laughs> and so here they send a squadron of ships to Lake Erie. Our president is James Madison, and he declares a day of prayer. September 9th, 1813. You know what happened? There's the proclamation. You know what happened the very next day? September 10th, 1813, is when the British show up at Lake Erie and we have 28-year-old Captain Oliver Hazard Perry. Most of his crew are free blacks from Ohio. They've never really fought in battles before. And now they're facing this Navy that had fought Napoleon, the one-armed Commodore of the, the British. And so the British have long-range cannons. And they splintered the American flagship, the USS Lawrence, to pieces. The American cannonballs can't even reach the British ships. And so they expect Captain, Captain Oliver Hazard Perry to raise the flag and surrender. Instead, he gets on a ship, a little boat, and he sails to his second ship called the Niagara. And uh, this gutsy young guy, by this time, the wind changes direction of the battlefield uh, the, on the sea, and uh, he sails his Niagara directly across the British line, firing every cannon away like a madman. When he gets to the other side, the wind clears the smoke away. He had disabled the entire British squadron. <laughs> Never before had an entire British squadron been disabled at one time by this 28-year-old guy, and this is the Navy that fought Napoleon. And so Captain Oliver Hazard Perry tells the men on deck, the prayers of my wife are answered. <laughs> he writes to the Secretary of Navy, it has pleased the Almighty to give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force of my command after a sharp conflict. The president, James Madison, says, It has pleased the Almighty to bless our arms. On Lake Erie, the squadron under the command of Captain Perry, having met the British squadron of superior force, a sanguinary conflict ended in the capture of the whole. This was a miracle. This allowed America to take back Detroit. Remember, there was the chief Tecumseh, and he was fighting with the British. The British were inciting the Indians to fight Americans. And so William Henry Harrison is able to, to win the, the Battle of the Thames. And so we finally get back the uh, Northwest Territory because of this 28-year-old gutsy guy that refused to surrender, and he trusted God. Well, the British aren't done yet. They send their army into our capital. Our soldiers run away. Run away, run away. <laughs> the British just walk right into our capital. Well, uh, Dolly Madison was in the White House, and they were setting the table to have dinner. And she hears this ruckus in the street. She get, takes the painting of George Washington off the mantle of the fireplace, and she's riding out of town on a carriage while the British Admiral George Cockburn is riding into town. He rides right up to the White House. He goes inside, sees the table set with the food. He sits down and eats dinner and then torches the place. And then he goes to our capital. That's him with our capital burning in the background. He goes to our U.S. capital, has his soldiers sit in the chairs of our congressmen, and he says, who votes to burn the American capital? They all say, I, and they torch our capital. And they torch the treasury and the library of Congress. They attack the Navy Yard. Well, then we read that the sky darkens and the winds roll in and the thunder grows to a frightening roar, and lightning begins striking at the British troops. A tornado touches down, picks up British cannons, throws them yards away, knocks down roofs and chimneys on the British soldiers, slaps horse and rider to the ground. In the book Washington Weather, it recorded British Admiral George Cockburn exclaiming to a lady, great God, madame, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed to in this infernal country? To which the lady replied, no, sir, this is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> yeah. The British are driven out, torrential rains come and extinguish the fires. And uh, then the British go back to their ships. Two of their ships were actually blown ashore. And so one British historian writes, more British soldiers were killed by this stroke of nature than by all the firearms the American troops had mustered in the feeble defense of their city. President James Madison writes, the enemy, by a sudden incursion, succeeded in invading the capital of the nation. During their possession, though for a single day only, they wantonly destroyed public edifices. Independence is now to be maintained with the strength and resources which heaven has blessed. Then the Congress uh, asks Madison to declare a day of fasting. 
And it says, the two houses of the national legislature express that in the present time of public calamity and war, a day may be recommended to be observed by the people of the United States as a day of public humiliation and fasting and a prayer to Almighty God, his blessings on their arm and a speedy restoration of peace. So Madison goes ahead and he declares this. And it goes on to say, of confessing their sins and transgressions and of strengthening their vows of repentance, that he would be graciously pleased to pardon their offenses, I have deemed it proper to recommend a day of humble adoration to the great sovereign of the universe. You know that phrase of confessing their sins and transgressions? It appears over and over again in the proclamations that these presidents give. You know, have you ever played with magnets? And maybe you've got two magnets and they're sort of stuck together and then you turn them and they repel. Let's say there's two magnets. One magnet is God and the other magnet is you. The God magnet has two sides to it. One side says, I want to bless you. And the other side says, judgment, right? Blessings, cursings. And then the you magnet has two sides to it. One side says, repent and believe. And the other side says, doubt and sin. So if you have your repent and believe side facing God's, I want to bless you side, the magnets stick together. But if you have your doubt and sin side facing God, it's like turning that magnet. God still wants to bless you, but he can't bless sin. Right? That's the sin of Balaam. Remember uh, the children of Israel coming into the promised land and uh, King Balak gets Balaam to stand on a hill and curse him, comes out of blessing. Try it again, comes out of blessing. Come, King Balak is pulling his hair out, says, I told you to curse him. And Balaam says, you can't curse what God has blessed. But a couple chapters later, you read where Balaam told Balak, if you send these young Moabite girls into the Israelite camp and lure those young men into sin, God can't bless them and you can defeat them in battle. And so this got God really upset and of course Balaam was killed. But this was the, the thing. So the, is, if we sin against God, God cannot bless sin. We have to repent of our sin and God can't bless doubt. Remember Jesus went into his hometown of Nazareth and could do very few miracles there because of their unbelief. And it's, it lists those that are the unbelieving as those that are you know, thrown in the lake of fire, right? And so if we insist on having our doubt and sin side facing God, God's magnet flips around to judgment. Sin attracts God's judgment. And so our founding fathers understood that before God can bless us as a nation, we need to confess and repent of our sins. You wonder today if the government could even identify a sin. Anyway, so after they attacked it, their U.S. capital, the British moved their navy to Baltimore. It's the third biggest city in America. And they pound away with 1,800 cannonballs nonstop for 25 hours. And uh, you picture the storms uh, is lightning and flashing. Uh, everybody in Baltimore had to extinguish the lights in their windows. So at nighttime, the British couldn't see any lights to know where to shoot. And now lightning fly. And then the British had these new bombs that blew up in the air, right? Bombs bursting in air. And so uh, the British had captured a doctor, William Beans, accused him of spying. And so they had him on a ship. And so Francis Scott Key is going out there to try to negotiate a prisoner exchange. We got some of your British guys. You got our Dr. William Beans. Let's do this. And the captain, uh, the admiral says, uh, we're about to attack you, so you're, we're not going to talk uh, prisoner exchange. You're going to spend the night on this boat. And so Francis Scott Key is watching. And the British pound away. I mean, again, this is the most powerful navy in the world, pounding away. Now, Fort McHenry is an earthen fort, right? So it's mud piled up. And that rain soaked the ground, so a lot of those cannonballs sank in the mud. Anyway, the next day, Francis Scott Key sees the flag still waving. And he writes the Star Spangled Banner. Actually, he takes the song, When the Warrior Returns from Battle Afar, and sort of rewords it. And we're all familiar with the first verse, but I think we should start singing the fourth verse. It says, Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their love at home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner and triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now that phrase, in God we trust, became our motto. It officially became our U.S. motto, and it was put on our coins. It was the last thing Lincoln signed into law before he was shot, was to put in God we trust on our coins and then it was Eisenhower that put it on our paper currency. We are a country that acknowledges God. And um, now, the war's officially over, but there's no telephones to call New Orleans. So what happened? The British attacked New Orleans. Now, the British were inciting the Indians to attack America. This is how, this is how the British took over India. 
they would come into one kingdom and give them guns and go to the other kingdom and give them guns and incite them to fight each other. And when they beat each other up, the British would come in and conquer both. And they would do this kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. Uh, we sort of did this in America when we're busy with the Civil War. After the Civil War uh, is when the France, French had sent over Maximilian I. And he and his wife Carlotta are like reforming Mexico and giving the people, canceling their debt and widening the streets of Mexico City. And the people love him. I mean, they actually went to Europe and got him to come. But America begins to leave train car loads full of guns along the border for Pancho Villa because the Monroe Doctrine is we don't want a European presence in uh, the Western Hemisphere. And so America gives the guns, and Benito Juarez is able to kill. And then he ends up killing Maximilian I. And, um, and Woodrow Wilson did the same thing. He had picked out a gang leader named Carranza, and he was fighting Pancho Villa and Huerta and uh, Emiliano Zapata. And so here's Woodrow Wilson leaving train car loads full of guns, sort of like um, the Fast and Furious with uh, Eric Holder, you know, leaving guns for the Mexican drug gangs, right? And sort of we found out now that's when, but, but what Benghazi was, right? So uh, we ended up, um, our president decided to take out the leader of a nation, Libya. We were not at war with Libya, but he decided to knock him off. And then uh, we find out that they're moving the guns from Libya through Benghazi to arm the Muslim Brotherhood to take over Syria. And, um, and then, uh, so that's a whole lot of Hillary's emails were on these drug li lists of um, gun transfers. And, um, and so this is what the British were doing. The British were going to the Indians, giving them guns and inciting them to attack our Americans on the frontiers. And so uh, the rumor went out that the British were going to pay in gold for American scalps. And so they attacked Fort Mims, Alabama in 1813, and they scalped 500 people in Fort Mims, Alabama. Matter of fact, here is the historical marker. Fort Mims, here, Creek Indian War. Now, the Creek Indians were called the Red Stick Creek Indians. And the French pronunciation of red stick is Baton Rouge, right? So Baton Rouge is red stick. It was the red stick Creek Indians. But here, the uh, Creek Indian War, 1813-14, took place the most brutal massacre in American in in history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British at Pensacola in this phase of the War of 1812. Right, so this is what the British were doing. And so the uh, US government sends down Andrew Jackson and he defeats the Red Stick Indians at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And uh, one of the famous guys that helped Andrew Jackson was named Sam Houston. Right, so he was at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Well, after this battle, he's ordered to go to New Orleans. And so here you have the British. Again, the War of 1812 is officially over, but nobody has any way of communicating to New Orleans. And so the British have 10,000 of their troops. Again, these are the troops that fought Napoleon. They're their tough troops. And they're marching under cover of fog toward Andrew Jackson, who has his Tennessee and Kentucky sharpshooters, and the men of uh, French pirate Jean Lafitte. And Andrew Jackson says, look, we'll forgive all your French piracy in the Caribbean if you... The fog lifts. And the Americans see the British right there, boom, they just lay them out and they kill all the British officers. And now the British soldiers don't know if they should attack, they should retreat. And for 30 minutes, they're standing in the middle of the field, 2,000 British get killed. Only eight Americans. Again, this is the same British that defeated Napoleon, and this is worldwide. I mean, that would be a big deal today if 2,000 soldiers were killed somewhere. And so Andrew Jackson is considered the hero there of the Battle of New Orleans. And in 1815, he writes to Robert Hayes, he says, It appears the unerring hand of providence shielded my men from the shower of balls, bombs, and rockets when every ball and bomb from our guns carried with them a mission of death. And then he writes to Major Dravizek, I was sure of success, for I knew that God would not give me previsions of disaster, but signs of victory. He said, this ditch can never be passed, it cannot be done. I think, when did God give Andrew Jackson previsions? Well, he went to that big church there in New Orleans. There's a statue of him on his horse back in front of the church. And after he was praying there, he went and visited with the pastor, and he told him that the God gave him a vision of victory. Anyway, then Jackson writes to the Secretary of War, Heaven, to be sure, has interposed most wonderfully in our behalf, and I am filled with gratitude when I look back at what we have escaped. Now, the British were going to attack again, but then they get a memo that Napoleon, who had been banished to the island of um, uh, Elba there in the uh, Mediterranean, Napoleon escaped. 
and he's marching back toward Paris. And some soldiers say, stop. And he goes, what? You're going to shoot your emperor? And the guy says, well, I'm not going to shoot Napoleon. You're going to shoot. I'm not going to shoot. He says, well, fine. If you're not going to shoot me, join me. And they go, well, okay. And so now they're marching. Some more guys say, stop. And he goes, what? You're going to shoot your emperor? And they go, I'm not going to shoot. And so by the time he gets back to Paris, he has 100,000 men. And so for the next 100 days, all of Europe is catapulting toward this battle of Waterloo. And so every British soldier and every British ship has to be immediately recalled from America to go back to fight. And this battle is like, what, the Battle of New Orleans was 10,000 soldiers that the British had? The Battle of Waterloo is hundreds of thousands of soldiers. I mean, it's massive. It pours down rain. Napoleon's not able to move his artillery and cannons around. They get stuck in the mud, and he ends up being defeated, then banished to the island of St. Helena, a thousand miles from any land in the middle of the South Atlantic. But here, God allowed these politics to happen globally so that America could stay independent. Well, you know, uh, I had mentioned uh, last night how unique America is. The whole world had been ruled by kings and pharaohs, Caesars, Kaisers, sultans, and czars, and King Kamehameha and Montezuma. And America decided we didn't like the king thing. And so who's the king in America? Signer of the Constitution, Governor Moore, said the people are the king. Chief Justice John Jay said the people are the sovereign of this country. Abraham Lincoln said the people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. James Wilson, who signed the Constitution, says sovereignty resides in the people. They have not parted with it. And President Grover Cleveland said the sovereignty of 60 millions of free people is the working out of the divine right of man to govern himself, a manifestation of God's plan concerning the human race. Now, here's a question for you. So if the people are the king, who are the counselors to the king? Remember 379 AD, the Roman Empire is now Christian, right? Constantine converted. And so now you got a Christian Roman emperor named Theodosius. He's going to church in Milan, Italy. And the pastor is Bishop Ambrose, St. Ambrose. Could you imagine being Bishop Ambrose and having the emperor in your church on Sunday? Guess what? That's exactly what we have in America. The Pew Forum says that 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. I think 70% is a majority. And so since they are Christian, they're going to church, which means the pastors of America are talking to the king every Sunday. So the pastors are counselors to the king. Have you ever seen the movie The Lord of the Rings and there's this scene of a King Theodon and he's got this spell cast on him and he's decrepit and he's like on his throne and he's got gray hair and gray eyes and he's just out of it. And he has two different counselors. One is this ugly guy named Wormtongue. And he's whispering in his ear saying, stay asleep, stay asleep. Yes, your kingdom is being overrun, but just go back to sleep. Soon it'll all be over. And then another counselor comes in and talks to the king, and his name is Gandalf. And he like casts the devil out of the guy. And like right before your eyes, this king starts to come too. And he starts to wake up and he starts to say, dark have been my dreams of late. It's like, yeah, you've been out of it. He says, maybe you'll remember your strength if you take your sword. And so the pastor's job is to wake up the king. So you have two type of pastors. One says, oh, it's just, be, just go back to sleep and be real spiritual. And yeah, you are the king. Romans 13, every authority is set up by God and God allowed our founders to set up the authority so the people are the king. Yeah, but just go back to sleep. And another pastor comes in and throws a bucket of ice water on his congregation and says, wake up. You don't just have the right to vote in America you will be held accountable to God for what happens in America. That's why I'm so very impressed at Pastor Mark and Linda. I was talking with John Guandola in the back, and he says, this is tremendous what's happening here. This pastor has guts. What what is happening is God is using Pastor Mark to wake you up, and he's going to send you back to wake up your congregations. Even Martin Luther King Jr. says the church is the conscience of the state. Now, the most important thing is to bring people to Christ. But the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. Because if Sharia law Islam takes over, it's the death penalty for you to tell somebody about Jesus. Try it in Saudi Arabia. If North Korean communism takes over, you're tortured in a labor camp the rest of your life if you tell somebody about Jesus. 
And if the LGBT agenda has their way, like the mayor of Houston, Texas, that wants to censor all the sermons of the pastors, they're going to want to limit what you can say about the gospel. So if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are really convinced the gospel is the answer, you will be involved wanting to preserve the freedom to preach the gospel. Chief Justice John Jay, the Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of choosing the forms of government under which they should live. All other constitutions have derived their existence from violence or accidental circumstances. Again, your lives, your liberty, your property will be at the disposal only of your creator and yourselves. And again, Reagan, in this country of ours, took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, the founding fathers established the idea that you and I had within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. Thank you so much. God bless you. Yeah.